I'm gonna start with sleeping bags. The first thing you wanna think about is the shape of your sleeping bag. And we have three basic styles of sleeping bag. You've got a mummy bag, which is by far the most popular. Um, we also have rectangular bags and quilts. Mummy bags are the most popular style for backpacking. They tend to be lighter because there's less material. They're also more form-fitting, which means that uh, there's less space to heat up. Um, so you tend to be a little bit warmer in that way. They also have uh, a built-in hood, which greatly reduces heat loss. For some people, mummy bags can be a little claustrophobic. So if you're a back sleeper, it'll probably be okay. But if you're a side sleeper or belly sleeper, sometimes that hood gets in the way. You can get a hoodless mummy bag as well, but you'll still wanna wear a hat or balaclava at night, especially in cooler temperatures. Rectangular bags are another option. They don't stay as warm as mummy bags because there's a lot more um, room for warm air to escape around the neck. Um, they're a lot more roomy. They tend to be a lot bulkier and heavier as well because there's a lot more material. Now let's talk about quilts. Quilts are the standard setup for hammock camping, a top quilt and an under quilt. And over the last several years, they've become more popular with backpackers as well. A top quilt is kind of like a sleeping bag without a zipper. It still has a foot box. Some quilts have a sewn foot box and some have snap foot boxes that you can unsnap to open up, um, which allows your quilt to be essentially a big square blanket. Quilts tend to be lighter and more packable than a traditional sleeping bag because you have less material. You don't have that extra material that would be otherwise be underneath your back. They also be, tend to be a little bit cheaper because again, less material, less down that you're paying for. In a traditional sleeping bag, your back compresses the synthetic or down insulation, reducing the loft and warmth. Quilts are best paired with an insulated sleeping pad if you're tent camping. I also want to point out that there are specific sleeping bags designed for women and children. There's also big and tall sleeping bags. A woman's sleeping bag is generally going to be wider in the hips and um, when you're shopping for a sleeping bag, you'll see the bag listed as a women's bag. Um, some bags are listed as unisex. A child's bag is going to generally be shorter um, and more narrow. Uh, if you are a shorter person, that might also be a good option for you. They tend to, if you're a big and tall backpacker, there's a lot of options for you. Most sleeping bags can be bought in longer versions, so uh, an average sleeping bag might be six feet long. Um, but generally, you can order it at six and a half foot. If you need extra girth in the sleeping bag for more wiggle room, maybe you want to wear um, thicker clothes at night in colder weather, you can get a sleeping bag expander. And these are generally pieces of uh, down filled or synthetic filled material that zip into your current sleeping bag to give you five to six extra inches of width. The second thing to look at is the weight of the bag. A typical sleep system, uh, which is your sleeping bag and your sleeping pad combined, uh, ideally about three pounds. So um, your sleeping bag might weigh two pounds, your pad maybe one pound. Lightweight bags and pads can be very expensive. So do your research. Let's talk about the sleeping bag installation itself now. It's gonna be down or synthetic. A down bag is gonna be much lighter, loftier, and much more packable than a synthetic bag. Down is also long lasting. A good down bag can last 20 or 30 years. Whereas a synthetic bag might only last five to 10. One negative aspect to down is that if it gets wet, it loses um, almost all of its insulative properties. And it's almost impossible to dry in the field. This is where synthetics really um, excel. A synthetic bag can be easily dried next to a warm fire or just hanging out in the sun for a day. Water repellent down has become much more popular in recent years. This is down that's been treated with a chemical that prevents it from, um, from balling up and, and uh, losing its insulative value when it gets damp. You can also buy a wash-in product that will help add a water-resistant um, coating on the feathers inside of your garment or your sleeping bag. Synthetic bags tend to be much cheaper than down. They can be half the price or even less. When it comes to spending money on sleeping bag, you want to consider the life of your bag, what kind of use it's going to get. A good down bag can retain 90% of its warmth for 20, even 30 years if it's taken care of properly. A synthetic bag, on the other hand, will start to flatten out after just a few years of heavy use. Most backpackers will prefer a down bag just because it's lighter, more compact, and will last a lot longer than a synthetic bag. One word that comes up a lot when you're shopping around for down sleeping bags and jackets is this, uh, this term fill power. This refers to how many cubic inches one ounce of that down will take up. For example, um, if you're looking at a 650 fill power sleeping bag, what that means is that the down is of a quality where one ounce of that down will fill 650 cubic inches of space. A higher quality down might be say 900 fill where one ounce of that down will fill 900 cubic inches of space. 
So a higher quality gallon will have a higher number. What that means is less ounces of it in that garment or in that sleeping bag. So in the end, your sleeping bag will tend to be lighter because the higher quality down has a greater warmth to weight ratio. Next, let's talk about the temperature rating of your sleeping bag. This tends to be a little bit different for everybody. Um, it really depends on if you're a warm sleeper or a cold sleeper, it depends on what kind of weather you're gonna be backpacking in, hot, dry, cold, wet. It also depends on whether or not you've got a warm sleeping pad. For the past 15 years, uh, sleeping bag temperature rating standard has become more popular with different manufacturers. Now they don't all use a standard system, but there's a system called the ENISO number, and it's broken down into three different numbers. The ENISO rating system breaks down a sleeping bag temperature rating into three different categories. You've got a comfort category, a transition category, and then an extreme survival number. The comfort rating uh, is a temperature range that an average woman would be very comfortable sleeping in at night. The transition rating is a temperature that an average man might feel a little bit chilled um, at night while they're sleeping, and the extreme survival temperature rating is a temperature that might get you through um, an extreme cold snap, um, but you would be susceptible to hypothermia. If a manufacturer doesn't use the ENISO system, they generally have information on their website. You can also find information on blogs and reviews to get a better idea of um, what rating the sleeping bag that you're looking at might be best suited for. When you're reading the details on a sleeping bag, the outer shell is going to be made up of either a nylon, a polyester, or a Gore-Tex. And there's a D number, so the D stands for denier. The D number refers to the weight of the fabric and durability. Generally, the higher the D number, the higher the denier, the more water resistant and the more durable the fabric is. So generally speaking, a very lightweight summer bag is going to be a much lower denier than a heavy winter sleeping bag. I also want to point out that in some cases, manufacturers will actually add more insulation in a women's bag of the same temperature rating as a men's bag. So what I mean is if you're looking at a women's specific sleeping bag that's maybe rated for 20 degrees and a men's 20 degree sleeping bag, sometimes the women's bag will be a little bit heavier. This is because manufacturers know that uh, more often than not, women tend to be colder sleepers at night than men. So they'll actually add up to 20% more insulation, uh, especially in down bags, to accommodate for that. Now I want to talk about sleeping pads. Sometimes the sleeping pad underneath you is even more important than the insulation that's on top of you. So we've got three different styles of pads that are out there. There's closed cell foam, there's the self-inflating style sleep pad, and then you also have the inflatable air pads. The closed cell foam is by far the cheapest. You can find these for three to maybe $20. Um, they're also very durable. They tend to be a rubbery material, uh, anywhere from a quarter inch to a half inch thick. They're not very comfortable to sleep on at night unless you're a back sleeper. They can be very hard if you're sleeping on your side, but they don't weigh very much. Um, they're not very compact, so you'll see a lot of people with these big rolled up sleeping pads on the outside of their backpacks. Some sleep pads fold up like accordion style um, or square style. Some people even have camp chairs um, that can open up into sleep pads. One of the perks to these closed cell foam pads is because they're so durable, they make great uh, camp chairs. You can pop it off your pack and sit on the trail and not worry about it popping or getting scuffed up too bad. You can also cut them to shape if you want to make your sleep pads shorter. Um, or cut a few corners off, help save a few ounces, you can definitely do that. The next style I wanna talk about is a self-inflating pad. These have a valve that you can open up, which allows the foam inside to expand. These are kind of a mix between a closed cell foam and an inflatable pad. These are not as durable as closed cell foam. They tend to actually be heavier than closed cell foam, um, but still a little bit more compact. They're definitely more comfortable, but the cost is a little bit higher. These are gonna range from 50 to maybe $100. You can buy self-inflating pads that are um, full length, or some people, in order to save weight, they'll get a three-quarter length, three and a half length pad. The third and most luxurious type of pad are the inflatable sleeping pads. Now, some of these sleeping pads just use air. And if you're in colder weather, the air inside the pad is gonna be about the same temperature as the air outside. So these are not ideal for cold weather. However, some inflatable pads have mylar, inside which reflects body heat 
and are great for three C's. And a good example of this would be like the Thermarest Neo Air Pads. Some companies even incorporate down into their inflatable pads. The down mat made by XPED is a fantastic example of this. These pads are the most comfortable for side sleepers or belly sleepers. You can inflate these by blowing into them. Some people will buy little battery powered pumps that are just, they're really compact now. Um, they can fit in your hand. There's also bags that you can fill with air that sometimes come with the sleep pad. And what you do is you fill these bags with air just by scooping up air, rolling the top down, and you can use these squeeze bags to inflate your, your sleeping pad without having to, to spend you know several minutes blowing them up by mouth. Inflatable pads are not as durable as closed cell foam. Um, they could pop in the field, so you make sure to have a patch kit with you and know how to use it. Some of these pads can be very noisy. The Neo Air pad, for example, can sound like you're rolling around on top of a potato chip bag all night. The inflatable sleeping pads are gonna be the most expensive. They'll start around $100 and go up from there upwards of two to maybe $300 for the, the extreme cold weather pads. Now keep in mind, not all sleeping pads are created equal. There's lots of insulated pads for different types of temperatures. The ability of a pad to keep you warm is determined by its R value. The higher the R value, the warmer the pad. Generally speaking, for three season camping, which is roughly five to 30 degree weather, you wanna have an, a sleeping pad with an R value of two to three. Let me ask you something. Would you dress the same outdoors as you do at home? When you're out backpacking, you have to deal with a much different environment, and it changes all the time. It could be hot, dry, wet, cold, you need to be able to accommodate for different types of temperatures. When you're out in the elements, you'll need to have sufficient insulation to keep you warm in a variety of different temperature ranges and weather conditions. Today we're going to talk about clothing for three season backpacking. It really boils down to this key concept that you've probably heard before called layering. Generally when people go out in cooler weather, they grab a big jacket. When you're backpacking, you don't want to have big bulky items. Thinner fabrics that allow you to stay cool when you're active and keep you warm when you're not active, like when you're sitting around camp, are gonna be your go-to. The goal is to carry less bulk and weight while increasing your comfort while backpacking. Multiple thin layers are way more versatile in the long run. As far as materials go, avoid cotton when backpacking. This means cotton socks, cotton underwear, cotton t-shirts, blue jeans, leave it at home. Cotton does not insulate very well at all when it gets wet or sweaty or damp. It takes forever to dry. Um, blue jeans, promote chafing, it's it's just not good. Synthetic fabrics like polyester and nylon are very durable fabrics for backpacking. They're also great at wicking moisture. They dry much faster than other fabrics. One of the downsides is that they tend to smell really bad after just a couple days on the trail. Also, any fabric that has a moisture wicking property uh, tends to get very, very chilly in windy conditions. So if you don't have um, uh, a windbreak jacket of sorts, for example, to cover up your polyester shirt if you're all sweaty and a big breeze comes through, you're gonna get really cold really quick. The alternative material for backpackers, and my personal favorite, is merino wool. I wear merino wool layers, socks, underwear, shirts. Um, it's great. It's not itchy at all. It doesn't smell as bad on the trail after a couple days like the synthetics do. It doesn't dry as quickly, but it definitely dries better than, than cotton. And the best thing is it stays relatively warm even when it's wet. So if it's soaking rain or you're really sweaty, it gets cool at night, that wool base layer is gonna keep you nice and warm. You also wanna consider the conditions that you're gonna be hiking in. Are you at high elevations? Are you in really thick brush, buggy, swampy areas? You might wanna consider a fabric that has UV protection in it. There's some nylon fabrics that are SPF 50 or even higher. They're great for high elevation. They're also great for paddling. If you're backpacking in really buggy, swampy, wet areas, you can get fabrics that are actually factory treated with permethrin to help prevent insect bites. Let's talk about underwear for a second. You want something that is synthetic, that's gonna dry quickly on the trail. A good mid-layer is gonna be a fleece pullover, maybe a down vest or a light jacket. Just be sure that if you're gonna have a campfire, um, be mindful of sparks because if you have any synthetic clothing on, it's very susceptible to melting um, getting little burn holes very, very easily. It's a great idea to have a base layer packed with you, even on relatively warmer trips. At nighttime, it's good to get out of those day hiking clothes, put on something comfortable that's warm. If it cools off at night, you'll feel much better. Some people prefer to sleep in a soft you know, fleece at night or some other base layer to help them stay warm. Short sleeve shirts are great for hiking in, in warm weather. Tank tops are great. Sometimes people get chafing on their shoulders from their backpacks if they've got tank tops. Um, if the bugs are real bad, it wouldn't be the terrible idea to bring long sleeves. Uh, you might get really warm, but the bugs won't be able to bite through the baggy clothing. 
long sleeve shirts with sleeves that can be rolled up and buttoned are very versatile. I love them. I use them for paddling to keep the sun off me. I use them in the middle of summer when I'm backpacking to keep bugs off. And in the winter time, it helps keep the cold wind from blowing through too. As far as pants go, I like convertible pants. I like the option of hiking in long pants or shorts. If I have to cross a creek, I can unzip the lower half of my zip off pants and not get the pants wet. Um, the long pants tend to keep bugs off of me. And uh, if I'm in really thick, brushy areas too, um, long pants help keep thorns and other things um, from scratching me up. Some people prefer shorts. If you're in desert or mountain conditions, hey, shorts are great. Rain gear can also be wind protection and bug protection. In the summertime, I generally just wear a rain jacket. I don't wear rain pants because my hiking pants dry super quick already. Some features you might want to look for are zippered ankles on rain pants. They allow you to get your rain pants on without taking your boots off. For rain jackets, I like pit zips. Pit zips are just what they sound like. Basically, you can unzip uh, underneath your armpits down your side. It just allows for more ventilation. For footwear, I like a solid leather hiking boot. They tend to be kind of clunky, definitely heavy. Uh, the most common type of backpacking footwear is definitely trail runners. Um, but you could even hike in tennis shoes, depending on where you're going. If you're in really rugged, rocky terrain, muddy terrain, then I like a little bit more ankle support. But for most backpacking trails that are well established, they're relatively clean, clear, and you can get away with a much lighter boot. Um, I also like to carry a camp shoe with me. It might be a pair of sandals or Crocs. These are not only good to wear around camp, let your feet breathe at the end of a long day, um, but if you have to do any creek crossings, instead of getting your, your boots wet, you can wear Crocs or sandals. You wanna make sure that your boots fit well. So there should be a little bit of a space, about, about as much space as the width of your pinky between your big toe and the end of your boot. This allows for a larger hiking sock to be worn and a larger hiking sock is gonna give you a lot more cushion and flexibility while you're hiking all day. You wanna make sure that your boots or hiking shoes are a good fit. So if you, let's say you wear a size 12 and you buy a size 12 boot, generally when you're backpacking you want a thicker sock to protect your feet a little bit better, uh, maybe offer a little bit more warmth. You wanna make sure that your boot can accommodate a thicker sock. So I generally go a half a size up or a full size up depending. And some people will also use a liner sock to help prevent blisters. Now this is a super, super thin sock. You can buy liner socks specifically, or even a light dress sock works. Basically, it's a thin sock that goes against your skin underneath your hiking sock. This allows the two socks to rub against each other instead of your sock or shoe rubbing against your skin directly, causing blisters. Let's talk about insoles for a second. A lot of footwear comes with you know, basic insoles. They don't usually have a lot of support. I like Superfeet brand or even Custom Orthotics. I've got relatively flat feet, so these make my boots a lot more comfortable. Other things you might want to consider are gaiters. If you're hiking in really muddy areas, uh, gaiters can help keep mud and sand out of your boots. Dirty Girl is a great online resource for gaiters. You can also get them from Outdoor Research. A few other companies make them. Um, they vary in shape and size, um, and different. Uh, they're designed for different types of weather too, from summer hiking to deep snow conditions. I recommend three pairs of socks two for day hiking and one pair for sleeping at night. Keep your sleeping pair of socks rolled up right with your sleeping bag and just use it at night. Um, give your feet a break and let your day socks dry out at night. If you have any questions about clothing or footwear, please leave them in the comments below. I'd be happy to help answer some of your questions. And for those of you that have a lot more experience, also feel free to share some of your insights, some of the mistakes you might have made over the years. I've certainly learned a lot from mine. It takes a long time sometimes to hone in a system that works best for you. Thanks for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to our channel. We'll see you next time.